Um, again, good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us on Facebook Live and here in Zoom. Um, my name is Logan LaPierre. I'm the program manager with the Tri-City Regional Chamber of Commerce. Uh, today, we are going to be hearing from um, many experts on cybersecurity, and um, I'm personally looking forward to the presentation. I'm, um, I think they're going to share a lot of really great tips and um, best practices to use for small businesses and individuals to use, um, especially for people like me when we're working at home. So um, I do want to say thank you to STCU for being our program partner. We are fortunate enough to hear a couple um, from a couple employees from STCU this morning. Um, while they're uh, going through the presentation, feel free to ask questions in the uh, Q&A box in Zoom. And if you're on Facebook Live, throw your comments or your questions in the comment section and we'll get to those as soon as possible. Um, but with that, I, uh, I am also going to mention that we do have a giveaway uh, plan. So I'm going to kind of wrap that up at the end of the um, Zoom webinar for those wondering. So with that, I'm going to stop talking and um, turn it over to our panel of experts. Thank you, Logan. Uh, my name is Gary Arnold. Uh, I am the marketing director at Executech. We are excited to be here with our guests and our friends here to talk a little bit more about cybersecurity. Um, I promise it will be interesting. Um, cybersecurity is a uh, both fun, but also a little bit scary, and we want to make it a lot more approachable through our discussion today. I want to go through a couple of quick introductions. Uh, Executech is kind of new to the Tri-Cities area, and we're really excited to be getting more involved with the community and be there with you. Uh, Paul is our GM there representing us in the Tri-Cities area. Um, Paul, why don't you just quick introduction to yourself and, and a little background there. Thanks, Gary. Appreciate it. <clears throat> For those of uh, you watching, I'm Paul Carlisle. I founded Elevate in 2005, and Elevate just became part of Executech here uh, in September. And so we're we're very excited to bring Executech's resources, including additional security resources, here to the Tri Cities. And uh, and I hope that in this webinar we can showcase some of those uh, those security highlights. Awesome, thank you, Paul. And then, of course, we're also joined by some folks from the STCU. We've got Nicole Tut and Sean Hafen. Uh, why don't you two introduce yourselves? Nicole, why don't you introduce yourself? Hi, my name is Nicole Tut, and my title is Director of Enterprise Security at SDCU. And as part of that, I manage both the cybersecurity and the fraud prevention teams. Excellent. Sean? And, and I'm Sean Hafen. I am the Information Security Manager here at STCU. Um, so as Nicole said, she manages you know, a vast umbrella under security, uh, including fraud. And we do work very closely with fraud and um, and compliance. So great. And last but not least, we also have James Fair uh, here from Executech. James is one of our VPs here at Executech. James, why don't you introduce yourself real quick? Sure. Thanks, Gary. Uh, Senior Vice President here at Executech. I take care of the Utah region. I also teach the compliance class. I've been at IT for oh gosh over thirty years now, and I've probably been in just about every position there is. So I've got a pretty broad knowledge of different aspects of this um, and in cybersecurity that entire time as well. Excellent, thank you all. Uh, I always like to start things off with a couple of quick fun questions just to get everybody loosened up and uh, get the audience maybe to get to know you a little bit better as actual humans and not just uh, you know faces in a square here. Um, so I wanted to ask real quick, I'll go around the, the room here around the circle, what is your favorite smartphone app, Paul? Any list. It's a great deal for managing uh, all the checklists. I'm a checklist driven guy, whether it's packing the kids for an overnight, weekly chores, employee check ins, or just grocery shopping. Love it. James? Uh, I'm boring. I use Google Maps all the time. I, I don't care if I'm going around a corner, I will use Google Maps. It is probably the high, highest used app on my entire phone. Drives my wife crazy. She's like, why don't you just go? You know how to get there. I'm like, what if there's construction or anyway? So Google Maps is my answer. Awesome. Sean, how about you? I think for me, it's going to have to be my password manager. I've got over 140 passwords and I don't know any of them. So without that password manager, I would not be able to do anything. Properly nerdy answer. Wouldn't expect yeah. anything less. <laughs> Nicole, how about you? Yeah, thanks for that. He is a nerd, um, but, I, but I'm, I'm proud to be associated with that nerd. So uh, I guess I'm a little boring too. I do rely heavily on Google Maps and I don't know if any kid anytime in the future will be able to navigate on their own with a regular map. Uh, 
but I probably play some really boring games like free sell quite a bit on my phone. It's pretty lame. No, that's awesome. All right. One more rapid fire fun question for you guys. What is your favorite movie? And I'll start back with Nicole. Gosh, I like the movie up, um, animated movie up. Um, it's, it's very touching. It's also humorous, but it's one of those that can appeal to both kids and adults. Some great messages there. Love it. Sean, how about you? Uh, for me, I'm going to have to go with Dune. The original was my favorite. And then the new remake came out and that replaced the original as my favorite. Uh, and my wife actually tolerated the remake, which is good. I love it so much. Thank you. Yes. Dune plug all the all day long. James? That was a really nerdy answer as well. I, I'm going to go with Dead Poet Society. That movie totally spoke to me. I really believe in empowering the next generation. So, oh, Captain, my captain. Love it. And Paul? Man, I'd love to come up with a real smart answer. But I, I mean, I just love that cult classic Empire Records. I mean, it makes me just, it just makes me feel like youth. It reminds me of the 90s. And, uh, and even around the office, we'll joke around with the Rex Manning day when we're excited about something that's on the calendar. So it's a great one. Great. Well, thank you all for sharing. Uh, those are, those are fun and some somewhat unexpected on some of them. So let's dive in into the meat and potatoes here and start talking for our audience. Uh, we plan on breaking up the discussion into kind of two categories. The first thing we want to talk about is the overall, I guess, landscape and, how things are trending in the industry in general in terms of technology and cybersecurity. And then we'll shift towards the latter half around some of the action items, some of the uh, ways to, to implement protection and prevention for cyber threats. So to start things out, um, you know, asking the group as a whole, and maybe I'll, you know, I'll start, we'll start maybe with James. What were some of the biggest changes to come uh, in the cybersecurity field in 2021? Well, we saw, um, I mean, it's no surprise to anyone, we saw a huge uptake in ransomware, right? Criminal organizations got involved, uh, uh, state actors got involved. So unfortunately, ransomware became even more prevalent than it was before. Uh, that's a, you know, a sad state of affairs at the moment, but that's where the live, world we live in currently. And work from home uh, created a new challenge. I mean, that wasn't new, we experienced that in 2020, but that kind of extended into 2021. And so we had to learn to, to secure the employee from home. We're seeing a lot of folks who are coming back to the office, but many who are not and may never again. So we're changing the dynamics and the tactics there as well. Yeah. Uh, Sean and Nicole, what are you guys seeing on your guys' end? What is, what's changed in the past year or so? Well, I can definitely echo what James said about the increase in ransomware, but what we're actually seeing a lot of, um, aside from attacking systems and new vulnerabilities, we're seeing a lot of imposter emails. So phishing happens all the time, but the new trend is imposter emails. So a lot of emails are coming in pretending to be the CEO or pretending to be your manager. And what they are trying to do is create a, a need, a quick need, like, hey, what are you doing right now? I need you to call me ASAP on my this phone number. Um, and then it'll be from a compromised email account, but it'll be signed you know, your manager's name or your CEO's name or some important individual's name, what they're trying to do is they're trying to trick somebody into typically purchasing Amazon gift cards or Google Play Store gift cards, and then emailing those numbers to them because they need those really quickly. They're away from their desk. They want to award somebody with these gift card numbers. And so they're hoping to take advantage of uh, somebody's human, good human nature to help out as soon as possible. It's a great observation. I mean, it was just this morning I got an email from HR that was not really an email from HR. Um, you got to stay on your toes. Nicole, anything to add there? Well, I think I think the nuance of the supply chain attacks that we've seen with products like SolarWinds was a big move forward. I, I don't know that it's completely new, but it certainly was a large one that, that was ex, you know experienced by a vast majority of um, people who are using products in that arena. Paul, any, anything to add over on the overall trends that we're seeing? I think it's really perspective uh, when I meet with small businesses. 2019 was sort of security what? This isn't about me. 2020 was, oh my gosh, people are going home. Security, I got to get a handle on this. And 2021, I'm really meeting with savvy business owners who are saying, 
how do I leverage security to be out in advance of my competitors, whether it's in talent acquisition or whether it's when winning customers, how do I use security as sort of a, a foothold in, in, in being competitive? And I think that's really smart and, and I'm excited to see it in, in some customers' uh, posture. I, I love that. I mean, security is so important just in general to protect your business, but it can also be a competitive advantage, just like you're saying, Paul, I love that. Um, as you all mentioned, of course, you know, the, the constant elephant in the room was the work from home the, and, and all of that that we had to adapt to in, in the work from home environment. And there still may be businesses that are trying to figure out exactly what that means, uh, especially going forward as we transition back and forth. Um, so adopting a position of flexibility, uh, how can businesses go about doing that? How can a business become more flexible and adaptable? What are some ideas or suggestions uh, that you guys have? Paul, I'll, I'll start with you. What, what, what do you think? Sure, I'm going to stay on that tack of, of the competitive piece. Um, again, I think that a big part of this is not in the C-suite or in the manager's room, trying to come up with ideas about flexibility or what you're gonna do as a business and then bringing technology in to try to implement it. Um, really smart businesses are starting with a technology first approach. And I think that as we go forward, technology will be more and more part of businesses that we even saw um, never consider technology as part of their, their driver. Um, and like Tesla or like others that are car companies but are really software companies, we're seeing this digital transformation in the heart of decisions that business owners are making as how their business is going to run versus as an after effect on how to implement some other decisions. So I think that that's really critical from a flexibility and, uh, and, and staying agile uh, in, in business decision making. Yeah, technology is a powerful tool. Uh, anything to add, uh, Sean or Nicole? Uh, I think aside from the obvious, uh, you know, getting the VPN up and running for your employees and what, allowing them to connect in from home or remote location, one of the things that's often overlooked or not mentioned or thought about is the mobile device management as well. So if your employees have a personal mobile phone, that can be set up to receive your work emails and your, you know, your chat messages and everything. So even if they're not sitting at their computer, they're still connected and they're still in touch with everyone. I would just piggyback on that as well. Um, really the importance of recognizing that this attack service area has really increased as employees move to work from home and all of those products and, and protections you've put in place to protect them in the workplace don't apply at home unless you do enable a virtual private network VPN that forces them to sort of use those um, workplace controls while they're at home. So um, really important. Great thoughts. Anything to add, James? Uh, yeah, the team covered it really well. I would just say, let's take the learning lessons we learned from what happened. Uh, let's do our best to predict the unpredictable, you know, to whatever degree we can um, plan, right? Plan and train, uh, practice it. Uh, we had an earthquake here in Salt Lake City that was certainly unexpected. So you never know. And so planning for those things and making sure you have uh, written, practiced, trained tests and uh, events in, in place can really make the difference. Yeah, great. Thank you. I do want to call out again to our audience. Uh, if any of you have any questions, big or small, feel free to ask them. Uh, we tend to throw out some tech terms out there. And if you're unfamiliar, uh, I think VPN is fairly ubiquitous term, but if there's other things that you're like, what are you talking about? What is that? Feel free to throw that in the chat. We, we're happy to answer those. No question is too small or big. And of course, we'll have some time at the end for, for open Q&A as well. Uh, so just to call out there. Uh, thank you all. So I, I do want to ask, you know, we're here at the end of the year, which is, you know, mind boggling to me, you know, Thanksgiving's next week, here we come. You know, what, what can we think, what, what, what should we be thinking about for 2022, what's on the horizon? And specifically, are there, and obviously nobody saw 2020 coming, so you know who knows, but are there things we should be anticipating? Are there rising trends uh, you know, on the sort of the criminal side of cybersecurity that we should be looking at? What are the big threats that we should look at for 2022? James, what do you think? Um, I, before you answer, ask big threats, I was thinking, the work from home thing is is continuing to be a reality. 5G is becoming a reality. 
So I think the ability for workforces to be able to work anywhere, anytime, and still remain secure is going to be critical moving forward for sure. That'd be my ad. Great. Nicole, you got you have thoughts on what we're what, what will be coming around the corner next year? Yeah, I don't have necessarily predictions. I think it will be more of what we've seen already and maybe even to a, a larger degree. Um, I don't see that the outlook as getting less rainy and cloudy, um, no pun intended. So I guess in the regard for specific um, controls or protections that would be in place for small businesses, I think it's really important, as we mentioned with VPN, but other ubiquitous uh, services such as email to utilize multi-factor authentication for those services, because as people are accessing them from various places, even outside the business, it's important you ensure that the person who's accessing that account is in fact the person intended to access that account. Great advice. Paul, what do you think? Oh gosh, uh, you know, I think if the pandemic taught us anything, sometimes it's not the, the issue at hand is not the virus itself, it's how people react. And when I look at 2022 and I think about security, I, what I see is for every business that's, that's doubled down and getting into security and really making it a part of their business, there are three others that are skirting. And so I think the best thing that small business owners can start to do other than taking security seriously in their business is to look at who their vendors and their partners are as well as their customers and ask them questions about their security that they're putting in place in their business. Because a lot of times those emails are coming from businesses that maybe aren't taking security as seriously and are allowing those bad actors to then have access to the emails of, of your employees. Um, so by gaining access and just opening up that dialogue and that conversation with other small and medium businesses that you do work with uh, and, and really make sure that uh, that they are taking security as seriously as you are, especially if you rely on them in your business. Um, it, from a, a macro perspective, we saw the, the oil uh, pipeline uh, get shut down, right? Um, so now if we take that into a micro perspective and you really count on a, a vendor in order to deliver your services and they get shut down because of crypto, um, even your best security doesn't protect you from, from some of that, that uh, reliance on someone who, who didn't take security seriously. So, so I'd get those conversations out in the open and make sure that your security posture is matched with the vendors and the people that you rely on. You know, that's great stuff, Paul. And I do, I do want to pull on that thread a little bit more. Um, obviously, you know, our audience, if you're here, you obviously have care a little bit about cybersecurity, which is awesome and great. I think there may be still, hopefully not too much, but a little bit of a misconception that uh, I'm a small business. I'm not a target. I'm too small for these guys to go after me because what you see in the news is the huge stuff, you know, the solar winds, the pipeline, these mega corporations, these fortune 500 companies, that's what the bad guys go after, which is true, which is what you see in the news. But I did want to throw it to this group and just help maybe correct a little bit of that misconception because it is a misconception. Anyone want to chime in there, James Yeah. or Sean? Sorry. Let's go, Sean. Oh, sorry. I was just going to say, it, it's kind of hard to say what the number one threat will, will be in 2022, because it kind of depends on the market um, or the business type. But to your point, they're really going to go after anything they can. And the first thing they're going to go after is the low-hanging fruit. So because of that, some of the smaller businesses are the targets. And we have seen several cases of local businesses in our area uh, get compromised. And their employees' email account have been used to send out phishing emails and imposter emails. And, you know, we've had to reach out and say, you know, we're just want to make sure you guys know and you're aware that this is happening. And they usually say, yep, we've been getting phone calls on this all day. Uh, our email was hacked or so-and-so's account was hacked while they were on vacation. Uh, and you don't want to get that phone call. You don't want to have to clean up that mess. So it's unfortunate that as human beings, we all tend to have somewhat that uh, it won't happen to me attitude, but I think we have to all start pretending like we think it might happen to us and we need to just take those steps to make sure it does not. We, we, we say it uh, often, and sorry, James, I know you'll probably chime in on this, but it's an unfortunate truth that we say it's a matter of when, not if. 
and you should plan and think accordingly. Uh, it's just the unfortunate reality that we live in today. James, what thoughts do you have? Yeah, I, that's something I was definitely going to add is I, I appreciate the perspective that we want to block them as much as possible, but we should also take the perspective of what do we do when it happens? And hopefully it never happens to any of us, but if it does, you're going to be far better prepared than if all you did was prepare for the event, you know, for blocking them getting in. And I've had the unpleasant job of browsing an attacker's Tor site to see uh, if a company's data was released in, in there. And I can tell you it's every organization out there. It's, it's a gas station. It's a small uh, retirement community. There, unfortunately, there are no restrictions to the bad guys. They're going after everyone and everything. There's ransomware as a service now. I can go pay someone else and use their product and, and distribute it as rapidly as I can. And whoever gets hit, I'm going to hope they pay. So there are no, yeah, unfortunately, it's every target. And like Sean said very well, it's low hanging fruit. That's the one that's probably going to get hit, unfortunately. Yeah. I'd like to add in the accidental hacker, right? Um, so one that, that we saw recently was uh, an employee who, I mean, was, was really just trying to do a good job uh, at, at their office. They were trying to uh, be more productive, make things more accessible. So they set up a Dropbox account and created a folder and they made the folder public accidentally. And they started copying all of their corporate material up into this public folder in Dropbox. Um, now, luckily we had visibility in this giant transport of data that was headed up to Dropbox and we were able to catch it. Um, but had we not had that visibility, had we not seen it, that employee would have proceeded to just make everything public in a way that, um, that a, a real hacker could have come by and taken that. But posting your company information into shadow IT this is just a normal course of business that happens every day with these what I call accidental hackers, just trying to do right by the company, trying to, to be productive, trying to be effective and just and making the wrong call because they just didn't know. And so um, I think that that's a piece that that as we look at bad actors and we think about these bad guys on the outside, sometimes forget about these accidental hackers inside our office that are really just employees. Uh, I'm sure we'll we'll. we'll dive a little more on that. Uh, it's a very common theme in cybersecurity. It, it really comes down to the individual. Uh, we'll dive more into that in a little bit here. Uh, I want to reassure our audience, it does sound a bit doom and gloom, but we are going to dive now into some of the steps, techniques, tools, and so forth that you can start putting in place. Some of them very simple, some of them very inexpensive or affordable or even free uh, that are already built in with some of the things you use in your business day to day. So let's start talking about a little of those, uh, a few of those things. One thing, one question I do want to pose out there is in general, and this is kind of a chicken and egg question I, I, is my guess, but what is more important, individual protection or corporate protection? You see everybody's, the gears are turning because it, I I asked that because I know it's kind of a, a, a puzzler. Sean, what do you think? That is a chicken and egg question. So they're both equally important, I would say. And think about it this way. So the corporation is made up of individuals. And so those individuals are the ones that are clicking on the links, opening the emails, visiting the website. So uh, overall, I think uh, they're both equally important as far as the protection goes. Um, and the corporation is going to contain the individual's information. So I wouldn't say that one individual's private information is more important than a, you know, a database of thousands of individuals. It's still personal information. It still should not be leaked out or stolen. Um, and it should definitely be protected, whether it's a corporation or an individual. I think I would add to that. I completely agree that you cannot have one without the other. The analogy I like to use is if you think of security as sort of a home, I could have all the locks and amazing locks on the doors and windows, et cetera. But if my employees leave the windows open, uh, that becomes a problem. And so education for those employees is really important. I would add, we've spent, and it's an impossible question, but I think historically we have focused on the corporate side of things and we're starting to see that the hired employee at 6 p.m. who's clicking on email messages is typically the attack vector these days. And so that's where we need to put more focus is on the individual protection. 
Well said, everyone. So let me let me ask this: What is what are some of the basic 101 things you should or can do to protect your business or yourself today from cyber threats? I think the big one, is, and Nicole touched on it. I think a couple other people have mentioned is just training and education. So you don't know what you don't know, um, and that can be said for anyone. If if you don't have the education and you don't have the training, how are we expected to know what to look out for um, and recognize that and take any appropriate action? So it, it's key. Training and education are key to that. Props to everyone here who's listening, getting a little more educated. And I love that, Sean. I, the piece that, that I was thinking when, when Gary asked the question was, was making it a priority in your business and talking to your employees about it. And I think that even if you have training resources and you have some of these other elements in play, um, in, unless it becomes a priority, unless your employees know that it's a priority to you, that it's a priority to the business and you create that open dialogue and you really start having that discussion, it will just be another box to check and they'll get around to it, right? We all are super busy um, with the great resignation. We're all maxed out and we're, we're doing more than we should or more that we, than we've usually done. We all have Zoom fatigue. We all are looking to, to maximize what we can do without the busy work. And so security has to come from managers, has to come from owners as something that's critical and urgent and not busy work. I think providing them with something tangible as well. So it's one thing to speak in theory about watch out for X, Y, and Z, but we like to sort of game with employees and send them phishing, uh, phishing tests. And so it's not all slap the hand, it's really about rewards for recognizing and then pushing the education in the event that they fail that phishing test. Keeping it fun, I love that, Nicole, nice. It's gotta be fun, nobody's gonna do it. I would, and on the unfun side of things, um, what Paul said really illustrated it well, is that even a simple breach policy where everyone in the, in the organization is trained on what to do in the event of a suspected attack or breach. A lot of folks have no idea what to do. And by the time they get a hold of someone who gets a hold of someone who can do something about it, a lot of damage can happen. So it's important that every employee be trained, you know, and then retrained annually so it's a top of mind for everybody. We, uh, we had a great question come in um, for, for the entire group here. What are some of the best resources that you can use for employee training? How do you provide that? What, how do you give them the training? Who's doing the training? Paul, let's start with you. Sure. You know, I think that there are a half dozen this and like online backup and a few others, this seems to be an industry that's really growing right now because it's needed. Um, know before is that one you can just pull right up online and it's pretty flashy and shiny. Um, but I would say that regardless of which platform you choose or which platform is supported by your vendor, um, I would say that the number one piece to look for from a, a uh, uh, from a selection process is something that has visibility to the managers so that they know whether or not employees have uh, completed uh, the training and and there and something that involves uh, some gamification as Nicole talked about something that that makes it fun maybe you put some prizes around uh, and and that has some quizzing afterwards that um, that allows employees to feel like this is part of something more than just a, a video that they'll play in the background while they do the rest of their work. Any other, ex sorry, go ahead, Nicole. I'm sorry. Uh, I agree that we use some products that we pay for, but I would suggest for some free resources available, CISA.gov, um, the Cybersecurity Infrastructure Security Agency, provides some great resources for Cybersecurity Awareness Week, which are available all, all full time. So it would be a great resource to look at. James, anything to add there? Nothing to add, sir. I think they covered it really well. Great. Uh, you know, small plug, there are often cybersecurity experts, local ones that will do trainings uh, for your team. Um, I wanted to ask a little bit more because all of you mentioned it in some way. Uh, just go a little bit deeper and, and tell us about what a phishing simulation is and what that means. It's not going down to the creek with your fishing pole. You know, what, what is an actual fishing simulation and what is the objective, the goal of a fishing, fishing simulation? 
Uh, James, I'll throw that to you first, because I know we've done some internally here at Executech. We've also done it for some of our clients. What does it tend to look like and what, 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 what is that? What, how does it go? Yeah, so the idea is that rather than an attacker coming in with a fake email and someone clicking on it, rather that we do that ahead of time. And we, we find the users who are perhaps a little more lax in that regard or not as paranoid and are more likely to click on those links. And we certainly see an uptick, right? As soon as we do a phishing campaign where we send simulated email messages out and we try to get people to click on things, we try to get people to enter their email address. Now we're a tech company, so doing it internally, we get pretty ruthless about it, to be honest. We don't, we're don't. we going the opposite direction of gamify. And we send things like, oh, that, we know that person likes puppies. So we're gonna send pictures of puppies and see if they click on it. <laughs> it's amazing the results we get. And it becomes kind of fun because we get to laugh about it afterward. Um, but we want to figure out who's going to do that. and. When we send those out, there's a big spike in internal tickets as people go, hey, is this a real email message? People start paying attention. It's top of mind again. And unfortunately, it, it, it trails off, right? So there's this big spike afterward. And then over time, it begins to trail off as people become more accustomed to not doing that. So doing it periodically is pretty important. It's, I mean, it's horrible to say, but keep people on their toes because it's better coming from your internal IT than it is from an actual attacker who's going to steal your credentials and do something terrible with them. Thank Does that you. answer your question? Somebody else yes. want to add some color to that? Yeah, I, I think the, the piece I would add that I when I have conversations with business owners is, um, hey, Paul, I, I don't, I just don't think this is a problem because we haven't been hacked. So why am I throwing money at a problem that may not exist? And certainly we don't want to then be hacked, right? Um, but we also don't want to then pay to put a bunch of employees through training if we don't have a problem. So being able to have something that, uh, that illustrates whether or not this needs uh, resource allocation or, or, or attention, I think is critical for business decision-making. Um, and that way, hey, look, if nobody clicks on it, then you don't have an issue. But what I'll tell you is I clicked on one of the emails just last month. And, I, and it was one of those, like, I wasn't typing in passwords. I wasn't really, but it's just, this is a real deal and they're tricky messages. And, and I felt for one, right? Uh, and so... Understanding that that exists and taking the, the training based on what I clicked on was helpful to me and, and I'm in the industry. So, um, so it, from a business owner perspective, I think it's just really helpful to have that intelligence. Fantastic, thank you everyone. What are some of the, we've talked a little bit about uh, training. Again, we, we're gonna emphasize this whenever we talk about cybersecurity, it really does come down to training, but what are some of the tools uh, that a business or organization should have? What's some of the bare minimum tools that, a, that an organization should have to protect themselves? Sean, what are, what are your thoughts? I think a lot of the, the bare minimum tools, I would say probably come built in with, you know, the servers and the computers people are using, making sure that the antivirus software is enabled and updated, making sure that you're applying updates to your systems uh, as soon as you can. So those are all bare minimum. They don't cost any money. Uh, on top of that, there's just some free tools out there that will do email filtering and spam filtering and firewalling and you know, data loss prevention. And there's there's a countless bucket of tools out there uh, with varying price ranges. But as far as bare minimum goes, we should all be at least checking those boxes to enable the safety and security and privacy and antivirus uh, scans on our computers and doing those Windows updates or Mac OS updates when they come in. And even, even your phone. So your, your iPhone and your Android phone, make sure you don't let, their, let the update icons sit in your notification panel for weeks. Just apply the update and restart your phone. Man, well, well said on the updates. Guilty of that one on both the computer and phone because I don't always want the new slick design, but it's worth the security updates for sure. Uh, anything else to add, James? Yeah, I, there are certainly some bare minimums that we consider. Um, I, I want to tattoo on the back of this picture here. It says MFA, right? Multi-factor authentication is, is huge. It's easy to implement. And just about every vendor out there supports it. And if they don't, you should harass them to make sure they support it. Um, as Nicole said, it's a, an easy, quick, and very effective way. It's not bulletproof, but it's very effective. So that's the easiest one. Um, we at Executech believe in backups. We hammer on that all day and night. Uh, we've had floods, fire, theft, ransomware, all recoverable if you have proper backups. And by proper, I mean they're off-site, 
uh, they are protected by separate credentials because that's one thing ransomware attackers will go after are those backups. They know that you can recover from, from them if they can, you know, if, if you can, if, let me try that again. They know you can recover from them, so they're going after those backups. Uh, we've had instances where backup drives are formatted because they got a hold of those backups. So they need to be separate credentials, keep those things under lock and key as much as possible, um, make them not deletable if you can, if that's an option. Um, then some of the things Paul touched on, or excuse me, uh, Sean touched on, email, anti-spam, uh, DLP or data loss prevention. So you're looking for keywords like credit card numbers that are inside your email. Um, and then some kind of a next-gen firewall at, at a bare minimum. Firewalls can do um, intrusion prevention. So they're looking for attacks and automatically blocking them. They're doing dynamic black, blacklisting. So that's kind of where one person who has the product gets uh, an attack and those IP addresses get sent to everyone else who owns that firewall so that they don't also fall to that, you know, fall subject to that. And then content filtering. You really need some kind of a web filtering in place. Uh, there's legal ramifications. There's other, you know, attack ramifications. And a lot of this can be prevented if even when people click on it, they can't go to the link because you have content uh, filtering in place. So those would be my go-tos for sure. Yeah, I'll, I'll jump on that content filtering piece. Uh, I think that for years I've heard business owners say, well, gosh, I want to give my employees privacy. I don't want them to feel like I'm snooping on them. Um, I don't want to be a micromanager, right? The, the, those feelings come up pretty quickly. Um, but with security involved, we have to have data, right? And so I would say things like DNS managers, content filtering, uh, web traffic monitoring, uh, employee productivity software monitoring. Um, some of these things are, are can be less of an HR tool and more just a looking for abnormalities, right? And without that data, without that visibility into things that are sort of going sideways or things that your employees now are doing differently, um, it's hard to to catch up with uh, with security risks as they as they come around. So um, so I, I beg business owners to think about uh, tracking more information in their technology, whether that's backups or whether that's content filtering, whether it's employee use of resources, um, so that as these things might get off the rails, we can react quickly and, uh, and respond accordingly. I would just add to what James is mentioning. I think backups are incredibly important, but it's also important to test the validity of those backups on a regular basis to make sure it's called DRP testing, disaster recovery. Um, and because you don't want to be the point in time that you discover it's not working to be the time you actually need the backup. So they, they do not always work the way they're intended to. Great thoughts. Uh, and We've taught, we've covered a lot already. You know, we're still going to, we have a few more questions we want to go through here, but you know, this doesn't have to be overwhelming um, it, it's piece by piece. You know, the, each of these things can be implemented piece by piece. Um, and, but, and, and the funny flip side of that is everything that we've mentioned here, we could have a whole webinar on. We could have a whole webinar on employee training. We could have a whole webinar on just backups, right? Cause there's, there's just, there is so much to it, but um, you know, turn to your resource of experts, uh, your IT, your cyber experts locally or wherever that you can to get the information, to get the help that you need there. Um, great one-on-one tips there, everyone. Thank you. Um, I want to bring up, um, I don't want to call it the elephant, an, an elephant in the room again, but, but something that should, I think, be on a lot of business owners and organizations' minds, and that is compliance. Um, I don't think there is a single business or organization doing business out there that doesn't have some kind of compliance that they need to be aware or of and, and follow. So I want to ask the group um, about the 101, the bare minimum tools that we just discussed and how that relates to compliance, because I've almost every type of compliance also has a data or cyber protection element to it. Any thoughts or comments around cyber protection and compliance and why those two are so important and connected? Paul, you're, you're nodding your head over there, so I'll turn it to you. Any thoughts there? Well, I think that it's it's one of those things that, that we saw come into the medicine space, the medical space there uh, with HIPAA, and then we're seeing come into uh, DOE and DOE have these some requirements in order to do business. Banking obviously has had these requirements, um, but I think that sometimes businesses say, 
well, my industry isn't regulated that way, so I don't have to follow those requirements, right? And while, while technically that may be accurate uh, by the letter of the law, I think if you look down the road, you're short-sighting your, your business model, right? By not taking a look at what is coming down the road. There are states like Louisiana, there's in, in Louisiana, right? I mean, I would, would not think of Louisiana as a progressive looking state on some of these things are bringing in regulation, regulation in Louisiana. We should put those words together for a minute, and blow our minds. But that's where we're seeing some of these regulations coming out that are holding people responsible for data leaks and those people that are being held responsible aren't necessarily hackers in Russia. They're you, right? Uh, the business owner that that thought that they didn't have to comply with with uh, with a medical grade uh, compliance area. So I try to get ahead of things before they get expensive. And and just like when we had the pandemic, those people who were panicking in in March and April because they didn't have cloud resources set up. Um, if you are set up then that way, when those uh, those requirements come down uh, down the pipeline, you won't be paying a premium to set them up. You will already be halfway there. Sean, Nicole, I know, uh, you know, in your industry, I'm sure there's just a laundry list of regulations and compliance uh, needs. Yeah. What are your thoughts there? There are. It, there is a laundry list. Uh, and I might touch on something Nicole mentioned earlier, some free resources. So. Uh, even if you don't have regulatory requirements or you know laws or guidelines that you need to follow, there are some free tools out there that will help you get ready for that or prepare for that. If you if you care about following those rules just to be safe and secure, or if you think that someday you might fall under that uh, category, uh, some tools such as uh, from CIS or NIST, which is NIST, uh, they have some frameworks and some tools that will allow you to evaluate your current uh, standing as far as cybersecurity goes um, and some guidelines that you can follow. Um, and those are completely free to use. Thank you, Sean. I might add uh, that I think privacy legislation is on the verge of probably if it, who knows what will happen on the federal level. That's a whole nother topic, but you know, California's already passed it. Washington um, legislatures have been chewing on a bill for quite some time. Um, I don't know what the timing of that may look like, but it's similar to the GDP on the um, European side where um, we would be required to abide by some of those rules from a privacy perspective. Uh, yeah. I'd like to add on something that Paul said, and um, it is pretty frequent that I, we run into small and medium businesses who say, well, we don't need to be PCI compliant. PCI is the payment card industry or the, the credit card uh, compliant regulation because uh, we use a website and things like that. And unfortunately, that just is not, does not true. Uh, if, if your organization takes credit cards and just about all of them do nowadays, then you fall under PCI. Uh, whether it, you're doing it on a website or not, that someone at, on your, in your organization is accepting the credit card data, that packet of data is being stored on a computer, it's being transmitted across your network, and going out of the field, so you want you do have to be PCI, you, or you rather you are PCI compliant. And I know only one organization, a law firm I worked with, who we gave them the list of things they needed to fix, and they said that's it. We're not taking credit cards, but most people uh, need to be PCI compliant. You know, I, I'd like to piggyback off of that. So James mentioned, you know, it, it kind of touches on the "it won't happen to me" aspect that we talked about earlier, and a lot of times we hear people say. I don't have anything to worry about because I don't have any data that's important, um, but I can guarantee you absolutely do, or you have an asset that's important. So even if you don't have payment card data on your computers or your network, your computers are the asset. So they will get into the computer and they will use your computer to attack somebody else's computer or to do something on nefarious over the internet. So if it's connected to the internet, it's definitely something that you have that they want. I might add too that um, well, you know, compliance and cybersecurity controls are incredibly important, but being compliant does not equate to being secure from a cybersecurity perspective. So I think a lot of people say, well, I've done what the regulations tell me to, that doesn't necessarily ensure that you're you're truly safe. You're never honestly truly safe, but the degree of the degree of safety is a little different. And just to touch on something Gary covered a little bit ago. This can feel overwhelming. I know a lot of small businesses who don't have an IT dedicated IT person or can't afford a full time cybersecurity person. It's typically a CFO or someone like that who's taking on this responsibility. 
And when you look at what's required, it may feel overwhelming and you tend to check out or decide not to do, go down this path. So whether it's us or some other firm, we can help you put together a roadmap. So you're not tackling it all at once. There are steps along the way you can do, you can implement, we can work with your budget to make sure it fits. So uh, please don't ignore it just because it feels overwhelming. Great advice, James, thank you. We had a question and, and Paul, I appreciate you dropping in that link there uh, for some resources. And, and so related to this question, what is a good resource or what's the best way to approach PCI compliance? And, and I'll add in any kind of compliance with the C-suite that may not realize it. And I'll, I'm gonna throw that to, to maybe Sean Nicole first, because maybe you guys have had to deal with that a little bit. I always uh, would advise to put it in the terms of business goals and business initiatives. So why is this important to us as in moving our business and being successful? Uh, so if you phrase it in those terms and why those components might be important to either um, avoiding a failure or evading, avoiding a disclosure, um, that's the most valuable from a C-level perspective. Paul, any, anything to add in, in terms of how you've talked with some of the SMBs and talking about clients? Specifically on PCI, I and mean, I think that that's what was in the Q&A. Yeah. Um, I, I, again, I go back to, to embracing your vendors. Um, the credit card, your credit card processor, your credit card vendor is really invested in your PCI compliance. They want you to be PCI compliant and they have resources, free resources, um, free programs for you to reach out. In fact, in most cases, the programs to make you PCI compliant um, that they provide are free. And if you don't use them, then they'll charge you. Uh, so, uh, so you may look on your credit card bill and see that you haven't completed one of their programs. So they're charging you an extra monthly fee. So take a look at that. And I think it's C-Suite's attention, like we're paying fees that we shouldn't. And then use that to, to take a look at some of those PCI programs that are available through the bank or through your, your credit card processor. That's a great starting point to, to, to work with them and some free tools to, to get you to a place where at least then you know some of the pieces and some of the education and some of the, the um, security changes you may need to make in order to, to become PCI compliant. But those are, those are just great free resources and a great vendor to reach out to immediately um, for, for instant action. Great advice. Thank you, Paul. And, and also, again, thank you for the questions. Great questions. As we wrap up, I think we've had a lot of a lot of information. Hopefully it's not too overwhelming. Uh, the last kind of topic that I want to wrap us up on is around what's called an incident response plan, which we've kind of alluded to a couple of times a little bit. And, and that goes back to the idea of basically emergency preparedness planning a little bit. So I want to ask the group, what is an incident response plan? Uh, how do I make one and what should it include? Uh, James, I'll let you go a little bit. I know we've had a whole podcast on this episode, so a little plug to go listen to our podcast on it, but just give us the high level bullet points of an incident response plan. Yeah, I'll keep it brief. Um, roles and responsibilities primarily. Who's, who from senior leadership needs to be involved when an incident happens? Who's going to be in charge technical? Uh, who, who will make up the incident response team? Who's handling PR communications? Um, and then, you know, the, the incident response team, you need to consider things like legal entities. Are you going to contact law enforcement? What about a forensic team that someone needs to come and check it out afterward? If you have cyber insurance, you, you need to have your cyber insurance provider contacted. Will you do any credit monitoring or fraud remediation? And should it come down to it, hopefully it never does, you may need a, a negotiator. Uh, as far as points inside of there, an incident response plan should include what are we doing when we, the detection and analysis phase, right? Um, how do we find it? Where do we find it? What do we do about it? The restoration phase. So hopefully we've cleaned it up and we're coming back from that. We're recovering from backups, whatever it may be. What's that look like? Um, and then also keeping in mind that this entire time you want to preserve as much data as possible to provide to your insurance, to provide to law enforcement, to hopefully they can stop these bad guys from ever doing it again. Um, ongoing monitoring, right? So if an event happens, there's typically some fallout afterward that you need to be watching for. Um, what else would be in there? Notification guidelines. Like I said, who are we going to contact? When? At what point? Um, and then it's really important to test on this thing. Uh, as someone mentioned before, I forget who said it, but train on this, test it, make sure it actually, you know, put it into play, see what happens. And then should an, should an actual incident happen and you need to go through this incident response plan, Make sure you're coming together afterward and 
getting key takeaways, uh, lessons learned, and, uh, and adopting those into your next IR, uh, version of the IRP. But I think the security gurus probably have more information than I do. Anything to add there, Paul, Nicole, Sean? I would just add, um, I mean, he hit a lot of nails on the head, but I would just add, you can also gamify this when you're practicing it. Uh, mm -hmm. You can make you know, fun scenarios for people to walk through and practice that with. And I think there's even a, a card game out there called Backdoors and Breaches, which makes it a little fun uh, if you want to really get into it. Great plug. James, James already touched on it, but I think, yeah, practicing this, and I think it goes back to user education. It's the whole meme of see something, say something. People need to be very comfortable at reaching out when they just see something that's just a little odd. Um, and not hesitate because the earlier we know, the, the quicker we can act and prevent additional damage. When, Gary, when I was listening to, to James list off all those things, right? Um, just sitting here, I sort of felt like, I felt this wash of overwhelmed feeling, right? Of like, oh my gosh, that's so much work ahead of me. Um, I haven't done any of this. What are we possibly gonna do, right? And, and, you know, just take that feeling for a second. And if you had an incident, that's how you're going to feel because you haven't done any preparation. And so just like any other policy you have in your organization, what's going to happen if it snows? What's going to happen if there's freezing rain? What's going to happen if someone shows up in the office with COVID? What's going to happen? I would say if you just start with this idea of what's the what if and let's put some brain power behind it and create a really basic outline of a plan then you can start there, right? And, and we can scale this along with business complexity and, and where, where you go. Um, but I think with, as with any planning, sometimes we put off all planning because we're not ready to make it extraordinarily comprehensive, um, where uh, I think any plan uh, is better than no plan to get started. And so just, just to start thinking about that, have those open conversations with your employees, with your department managers, uh, if we did lose uh, data, if we did lose our internet, if we lost, you know, sort of some of this continuity planning and and uh, and security issues, if we had these issues happen, what would they affect and what would they cost us? Just having some of those open conversations will start to lead you in the right direction, and then you can ask for help to fill in the blanks. There's lots of people um, that that have this sort of talent, uh, as James mentioned, uh, and lots of webinars that you can go to once you know what you need, and then you'll feel less resistant to it because it won't feel so overwhelming. Great advice. Thank you, Paul. Um, well, as we're wrapping up here, I just want to, again, uh, put it out to the audience. If any of you have any additional questions um, around cybersecurity, around technology, please feel free to ask them. We can fill them here to our group. Um, and of course, we do have a giveaway here at the end. The last thing I want to ask uh, each of you, and again, we'll have this be rapid fire, quick response. What is one takeaway? If you could share one takeaway for our audience, what would it be? Start with Nicole. Sorry, right, I'm gonna steal MFA. Um, protect your email, protect your email. Email account takeover is so prevalent and especially in a business setting, it could be so dangerous. So you need to make sure that it won't, may not be obvious to you, but there may be somebody monitoring your traffic and taking advantage of your customer in the midst of that conversation. Yep, multi-factor authentication. We'll say that all day long. Sean, what about you? One takeaway. I think, uh we should all just care about protecting our data and then the data that we've been entrusted with uh, for our customers or our members. And we just shouldn't have that, it can't happen to me attitude. Um, also, I'd like to throw out there that you can check to see if something has happened to your email address or your password has been involved in a breach. Uh, there are websites out there and I'll send that information to the chat. Perfect, thank you, Sean. Paul. Uh, I mean, make it fun. I love that Nicole said that. Make it fun. Talk about it often. Talk about it frequently. Get it out there and, and really just make it part of your organizational culture that security is something that, that your organization now is part of and, and that everyone should play a role. And then turn on multi-factor and change your password. Love it. And James? Um, yeah, we hammered on it a lot. Uh, a lot of organizations spend a lot of money on the infrastructure security aspects. And I want to reemphasize that training the users, and I'm an IT guy, so I'm going to give an IT perspective we didn't talk about for a moment. And that is give your IT and security folks some wiggle room 
to decline a request or to push back if something that you've asked them to do is insecure. If they come back and say, that's actually not best practices. I'm not going to recommend that. Please pay attention to those. Those are important. Great. Well, thank you, everyone. Uh, I think this has been a fantastic conversation. Lots of great uh, tidbits to share and to learn from. Uh, as you can see, it's been recorded. So I highly recommend going back and maybe rewatching it if you, you know, missed a piece or certainly sharing with your friends. As we've mentioned, cybersecurity should be a priority for everyone. Uh, I'll turn it back over to you, Logan. All right, perfect. That was a great presentation. It was a lot of information, but I think you guys did a great job of breaking it up into segments. Um, I made a lot of notes as I was listening behind the scenes. Um, and something that Paul said was get ahead of things before they get expensive. And I think that wraps up what you guys talked about very well. So um, we do have uh, the rec this recording is going to be available on Facebook Live. And we will, um, sorry, on Facebook. And we will make sure to upload it to YouTube for every, everyone to watch um, in the next few hours or at your own time. Um, I did mention at the beginning that we had a giveaway. Um, so as I was behind the scenes working, uh, Deborah Kay and Loanne Ayers are the winners. So we will be following up with you guys um, with some additional details using the emails that you use to register. Um, but with that, I just wanna say thank you again to our panel of experts. Um, I think this is our first time having a panel this large and you guys did a phenomenal job. So uh, thank you for your uh, time that you gave us today. And thank you to STCU for their continued partnership. Um, and with that, I hope everyone has.